Uh, well, so uh, let me uh, tell you a couple of words about uh, Moshe. Mm. Honestly, I prefer that Moshe will be with us today, tonight, and it's something like uh, several times we invited. Oh, okay, not several times. It's the third time we invite him to Warsaw. It's and something happened, COVID, some health problem, and so on. So maybe next time. Third time will be. <laughs> well, let's not invite him. <laughs> no, uh, yes, it's good to uh, find out where is the problem. Moshe, it's you or it's uh, it's. Us. Also, also, who knows? The universe, the universe is the problem. Universe. Okay, so uh, Moshe is a professor of um, Rice University, Texas, and um, he is also a Karen Ostrom George Distinguished Service Professor of Computational Engineering. Uh, currently, he leads the Technology, Culture and Society Initiative at Rice University. Um, he uh, received uh, many awards. I, uh, honestly, I was surprised how many. It's, uh, I look uh, in the long list of these awards and I was something like every, almost every year he uh, got some awards. And in 2020, he received three awards uh 2020 donald knut prize it for outstanding um uh, input for uh to, to the foundation of computer science um 2020 acm ellen newell award and uh, it's award for um i think that i'm right it's uh, for uh, multidisciplinary uh, achievement so between computer science and something else. And uh, finally, 2020 IEEE Norbert Wiener Award for social and professional responsibility. And here I would like to add that uh, what I know, I, I um, saw it, uh, that Moshe was uh, a, one of initiators and I think a main, main fighters for um, to convince uh, ACM to um, to stance uh, on the war in Ukraine, and he finished this fight, and they see him finally uh, express negative feeling toward this war and so on. So, uh, from my side, and I'm very sure from my friends from Ukraine, thank you very much. Okay, um, at this moment, I uh, stop myself and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Sorry for the slight delay. We had some technical difficulty with Web WebEx. And I'm sorry I cannot be you, be you in person due to a, a medical issue, family medical issue. The title might be a bit mysterious. I'm going to explain it as I go along. What is what am I talking about? Fast and slow thinking, machine learning, and logic. Let me explain. So there is a sense these days that uh, computer science is changing in some in, in in a very fundamental way. And the main thing is uh, right. For example, when I look at PhD applications, application to our PhD program at Rice, eighty percent of the students say they want to do AI, and by AI today they mean machine learning. So. And I'm sure you all heard over the past week over a chat GP, GPT, who is the most Polish bullshitter that I've seen in a long time. But uh, there is a sense that uh, there is a what people call Kuhnian paradigm shift. What do I mean by that? Thomas Kuhn wrote a, a book in 1960, I think, The Structure of Scientific Evolution, and he introduced the concept of paradigm shift, how sometimes science goes through. A, a, like a phase transition. Think of what happened. We went from the Ptolemaic uh, planetary model to the Copernican planetary model. It was a huge shift. And the sense is that when we have such a big shift, we are going through such a big shift today in uh, in uh, in machine learning in in computer science. And the old model, which was based on more models, formal models, everything is moved now to basically big data and machine learning. And you throw out the old model, you bring in the new, you, the old paradigm, you bring the new paradigm, and that's the, 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 you see there is a hype that this is where we're going today. 
But in reality, when you talk to philosophers of science, they say this was somewhat simplistic. That new scientific paradigms don't necessarily, we don't have to solve the old ones, we have to refine the old ones. For example, how do we go to the moon? Completely classical Newtonian mechanics. You don't need anything with relativity theory, you don't need anything with quantum mechanics. Classical me uh, Newtonian mechanics is good enough. So my thesis is that data science refined formal science. And I'm coming from the formal science area, and now we're going to talk about data science, and now I will explain my view of data science refining formal science. And so I'm coming from the logic side, which is about formal models, and now we have machine learning. And I think that, in my opinion, the right way to think about it was established by the Nobel Prize winning psychologist, got the Nobel Prize in for behavioral economics, and he published a book uh, just over a decade ago, Thinking Fast and Slow. And where he talks about really that there are two parts of the brain that operate differently. One is essentially fast thinking. When you go in the savanna of Africa and you see something yellow moves in the grass, you very quickly say, this probably is a lion, I better get out of here. So, and you run the hell out of them. And it has to be very fast. You don't have time to go and say, let's uh, do observation, collect data. No, you just immediately, based on your past experience, you get out of them. But then you go back to the village and you tell them there is a lion out there, let's go hunt the lion. Now you have to make a plan. This requires slow thinking. If I take a more modern modern uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, analogy, the machine learning, you know, you have autonomous vehicle and it, it, it sees a sign in the road, it has to know is this a stop sign or not. But then you need to know what to do with the stop sign. Now that's something there is a rule. Stop sign, you stop. So uh, machine learning is about pattern recognition and logic is very much about meaning and semantics. And there's an important paper was published by Amnon Shashua five years ago. Amnon Shashua was a professor of machine vision at Hebrew University and he went to fund Mobili, and which completely play a major role in autonomous vehicles using machine vision. And he, uh, the paper he wrote, he asked himself the question, how much safer do autonomous vehicle have to be than, than human-driven vehicles. He so said, right now in the United States, we have about 50,000 accidents per year. So that means about 1,000, uh, not accidents, fatalities. So that means about, let's say, maybe a little less, but let's take this number, it's a round number. That means about 1,000 people are get killed every week in a car accident. And this, nobody is, we take it as completely normal. Now suppose you improve safety by autonomous vehicle, by automation, by by 90%. So instead of 1,000 people getting killed every year, every week, it will be 100 people getting killed every week by autonomous vehicles. Is this acceptable? Well, philosopher must say yes, but he said the public will not accept. That means, you know, that means if you think about it, that means about uh, 14, 15, 14, 15 accidents, you know, fatalities per day. Think of what it's a big deal every time now AV kills a person. So he said we have to improve, we have to reduce it, in his opinion, a, a thousand fold. So we'll go from 50,000 to 50 per year, maybe one per week. And he said there's no way we can do it only by machine learning because it will mean we have to test drive about a billion miles, and it's just not feasible. But he said, if you combine data with reasoning, with models, then you can do better. So I think the grand challenge today is to how to combine logic with machine learning, which many people now call, call neurosymbolic reasoning. And let me give another motivation to do that. So we are seeing more and more automated decision systems. So important decisions are being, going to be more and more by machine based, machines based on machine learning. And in 2018, Jim Laros and Chris Hankin wrote a column in, in communication of the ACM, the widespread adoption of automated decision system will econ be economically disruptive and raise, uh, 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 raise uh, all kinds of societal challenges. And he said, this then for regulation is pervasive th throughout the tech industry. In the case of automation decision, decision making, this attitude is mistaken. And so today, really, how do we regulate automation system? People talk about fairness, accountability, transparency, and I'll talk about explainability. 
So what is explainability? Explainability is that we have to explain the, the decision made by, by machine to a human in terminology of humans. That means you can say I'm, I'm saying yes because this neuron fires and this neuron fires and this neuron fires. That's not a satisfactory explanation. Logic does provide us, reasoning provides satisfactory human, human level, human center explanation. And it's interesting that uh, Hermann Weil, I'm sorry, this is the type on 1895 to 1955, you know, important mathematician, early part of the 20th century, wrote, we cannot deny that there lives in us a need for a theory that is absolutely inexplicable from a merely phenomenalist standpoint, just based on the data. That need has a drive to create direct to symbolic layout of the transcendent, which demands satisfaction. Fans, nice, nice language, but it basically says we need high level explanations. So this is the grand challenge of today. And I'll spend the rest of my talk explaining what is my approach to, to this challenge? And my approach is to make logic quantitative. And that's what I will explain, focus mostly today, how to make logical reasoning quantitative rather than qualitative. Classical logical reasoning is yes and no, yes and no. I want to make it quantitative. So for this, I'm going back to the middle of the first of the 19th century and talk about George Bull. So George Bull took a discipline, logic, symbolic logic, that until the middle of the 19th century is really part of philosophy. Going back to Aristotle in the 4th century BC, it was always part of philosophy. It had nothing to do with mathematics. And Bull really find a way to uh, math mathemati mathematicize logic. And because he realized that you can, when you have a proposition, you can think of it like proposition, like as white. So well, it stands for the class of white things. So it's about classes of objects. So really it talks about sets, but this was before uh, we had a, a later development of set theory. But his observation is you can take the logical operation and you can look at them algebraically. So his intuition was that conjunction is really multiplication. So here X stands for white thing and Y for sheep, and XY, the product XY stands for white sheep. So conjunction is multiplication. And an analogously, this logical disjunction is, is addition. So you have addition multiplication, and also you have negation, complementation. So that's what will give us ultimately Boolean logic. Now, all of in the 19th century, people realize that logical, now you can be very precise about logical reasoning. And they realize that they, they didn't have necessarily terminology how to describe this problem. Today we express it logical as Boolean satisfiability. But the problem already were, was raised by logicians in the 19th century. But in the modern terminology, we have a Boolean expression using and, or, and not. And we want to know every variable can be assigned 0 or 1. And we want to give it a satisfying, satisfying assignment, assignment of zeros and 1 that make the whole expression to be true, 1. In this case, it's very easy to see. You take x1 and x2 to be 0 and x3 and x4 to be 1. The whole thing will evaluate to 1. But if you have four variables, you have only 16 possibilities, so you can do it by hand easily. What happens if you have 40 variables, 400 variables, maybe 4 million variables? What would you do then? How can we solve this problem? So this became, as a major, became known as a major open problem. As I said, all the 19th century people realized it. William Stanley Givons, who was a follower of a uh, bull in, in the UK, I have given much attention, therefore, to lessening both the manual and the mental labor of the process. I shall describe several devices which may be adopted for saving trouble and risk of mistake. And he built a, a machine from, called Logical Piano that could reason about four propositions. Uh, Ernest Schroeder, an algebra, German algebraist, wrote, getting a handle on the consequence of any premises, or at least a facet method for obtaining these consequences, seems to me to be one of the noblest, you know, the ultimate goal of mathematics and logic. So, so Schroeder says, this is the ultimate problem in mathematics, Boolean satisfiability. Problem stayed open. In the early 70s, uh, uh, Steve Cook and Leonid Levine independently proved the Boolean satisfiability is NP-complete. 
So now we don't know how to solve it, but at least we've put it in the proper place in terms of complexity theory. So we, people have been working now for uh, 50 years on NP completeness, still not much progress. But on the other hand, people have been working now for quite some time on solving Boolean satisfiability in practice. And that goes back to the mid-50s. Newell, Shaw, and Simon wrote the program called Logical Theories. They can do propositional reasoning. And then Davis and Putnam, Davis and Putnam, Davis, Logerman, and Loveland together kind of put together the uh, steps. And this became known as what we call the DPLL, Davis, Putnam, Logerman, and Loveland. And the idea is you convert the formula to conjunction normal form. So it's a, this is conjunction normal form, a conjunction of disjunction where all the, all the negations are on, applied to, to propositions. And then you just do backtracking search. But with one heuristic that's very important, it's called unit clause preference. So a clause is a disjunction here. Suppose that the disjunction only has one literal, like not x1. It's a de degenerate disjunction. Then there's no need to branch, because you know you must make x1 false, and you go on. So unit preference means always try to identify unit clauses and then pursue, pursue, uh, take the, the, as the force and assignment, go with that assignment. Now, over the years, especially starting in the mid-90s, a whole bunch of new heuristics have evolved. And by the end of the 90s, uh, people decided to change the name and they call it CDCL, Config Driven Clause Learning. And roughly, you can think of it as a combination of these five heuristics, but there are many, uh, several more, but these are the five key heuristics. One is back jumping. Instead of backtracking one level at a time, be smart. If you can jump several levels up in the, in the search tree, do it. Uh, we talk about unit clause preference. Unit clause preference required it to identify unit clauses. And people did it using counters. Each counter you, you kept, for each clause you kept a counter assigning how many variables are assigned. So this way you know what are the unit clauses. These turn out to be just assigning the counters, and you have to update them when you when you when you assign a value. And then if you backtrack, you have to unassign, so you have to update the counter again. It was very time consuming. So people came up with very smart data structure to do smart unit clause preference. Whenever this, the, you reach a failure node in the search tree, you analyze it. You analyze the failure. And you make sure you don't you don't make the same error again, so to speak. Usually there's some partial assignment that was bad. You have to block that partial assignment. Um, being smart about the cho choice heuristic is deciding which variable to branch on. And uh, people used to think that the goal is to have very, very smart choice heuristics. But it turned out if, you had, if the heuristic was very smart, it would take too long to, to compute. So the terminology I use is Brainiac versus the Speed Demon. Brainiac and Speed Demon are two enemies of Superman, but uh, Brainiac is is very fast, faster than Super. It's very smart, smarter than Superman, and Speed Demon is faster than Superman. But Superman has just the right combination of smartness and speed, and he defeats both. And finally, restart. If you go through a tree and you go up and down, up and down, you finally say, you know what? Let's just start, let's scratch the tree. Let's start this, the, the, the search from the start in some random way. But we, everything, all the, all the new clauses we learned, we'll remember them. And people build key tool, grasp and shaft to me were two milestone tools. And by now we have, we have a solver that can solve problems with millions of variables. Millions, it's amazing, millions of variables. And in fact, the, the speed, Ten years ago, a colleague of mine, Sanjit Chacha at Berkeley, decided to assess how much speed has been over a decade, 12 years, and he took 12 years of such solvers and ran them all on the same machine and the same benchmark problem. And he showed, this is log scale, he showed that what took 800 seconds in, in 2000 took one second or in, two, in, 20, in, in 2012 on the same machine, same problem. So see also went to improvement just by better and better heuristics. The progress has been so impressive that Don Knuth uh, it caught his attention 
and in 2016 he received the, uh, the, the he, he gave very prestigious for John von Neumann lecture, the same annual meeting, and uh, he gave a talk on, uh, on Boolean satisfiability. Siam News wrote an article about it, Knuth give satisfaction in Siam von Neumann lecture. And Knuth now a, a sub-volume of, of a sub-volume of, of volume four is all about satisfiability. And he wrote, the story of satisfiability is a cell of triumph of software engineering. I would have called it algorithmic engineering, blended with rich sources of beautiful mathematics. So it's a beautiful combination of theory and algorithmic engineering. So because SAT solving has made so much progress, people are now looking for applications of it. And one of the most uh, impressive stories is what happened in Microsoft Research that developed very good SAT, sol SAT solvers and the push for using it in software development. And so, so today, there are hundreds of machines at Microsoft uh, running SAT solvers in all kind of software, software development application, symbolic execution, model checking, static analysis, model-based design, and so on and so forth. So the progress has been rather astonishing. Now, I want to go from here to talk about verification of hardware and software system. So today, hardware and software is a very large, important industry, about billion and a half, billion and a half trillion dollar a year. Very, very important industry. And when you look at the cost of building systems, hardware or software, it turns out that a major uh, challenge is functional verification. How do we know that the system satisfy its intended functionality. And when you talk to people in the industry, they will tell you verification consumes the majority of the development effort. So yes, people have to write the code, but verification takes about 70% of the whole verification effort. Now I come from the formal verification side, but when you go to the industry and you say, okay, how much formal verification are you doing? And, and they say, well, how can we measure it? I said, okay, look at your verification team. How many people do formal? And the answer that I usually get is about 10%. So it's an important technology, but it's below 10%. What do other 90% people do? They do, they do testing, they do dynamic verification, they do simulation. That is still the, the main workhorse of functional, functional verification. So what is this approach, uh, which is dominant today? You simulate the design with all kind of what they call them input test vectors. Each test vector presents some, some verification scenario. And then you compare the result to what you know you're supposed to get. And that's, that's what gives you, if you have an, in, if you have disagreement and you, you found an error. The problem is that the, the test space is exceedingly large. Why is that? Think of something very simple. If you may remember in 1995, Intel, uh, the Intel Pentium couldn't do division properly. Floating point division was, was incorrect sometimes. Intel had to recall the chip and uh, correct it. Well, if you're dealing with 128-bit floating point numbers and you have two values, you want to do floating point division, then you have to consider two to the 256 possibilities. The sun will go nova before we are done. So, it's not scalable to try all of all possibilities. So we have to test. So test generation is a classical approach, manual test generation. The te verification engineer write testing scenarios. However, it turns out to write, write a test case, a, a good verification engineer can write about 20 test cases per day. It's like writing code. Uh, the conventional wisdom is writing one, li one line of code is a programmer runs 20, 20 lines per day. So a verification engineer write 20 test cases per day. It's not scalable. So in the mid-90s, the industry came with a new approach, which is random constraint test generation. Now the verification engineer writes a constraint to describe the scenario. Not the actual test, a constraint to describe the scenario. Then we take this constraint to a constraint solver to solve it. And the solution is the test vector. And we rely on the fact that by now we have industrial strength constraint solvers. So this idea of writing constraints and then using the solution as tests was proposed by 
uh, Liechtenstein, Malka, and Aharon from IBM Haifa in 1994 and become to the InnoC standard. But it's not enough to have the solver generate solutions because we don't want this, the, the test to depend on the internal of the solver. It may focus us in a very narrow, narrow segment of the test space. So we would, what we would like to do is to create solutions randomly and uniformly, uniformly at random. Why is that? Because we don't want to depend on internal of the solver. And there's no reason for us to depend, to prefer one error of the solutions to, to, to another one. We don't know where the error, where errors are. So we want uniformly at random. So this translates to the following extension of Boolean satisfiability. You're given a Boolean formula. You have a such solver. But instead of getting a solution, you want to find, you want to generate solution uniformly at random, and you want to do it for industrial size problems. So I was intrigued by this. Uh, I only learned about this in uh, uh, about 10 years after this method became standard, and I was very intrigued. How do we do that? It turns out that this problem has many applications. I just mentioned this problem of, of uh, constraint sampling, I call it, has many applications. I'll mention another one. I mentioned one, which is random constraint test generation. The other one is from personalized learning. So today you have things like MOOCs, okay, massive open uh, uh, online courses, and a course can be taken by 100,000 students, and you want to give them home assignment. Well, if you give everybody the same assignment, then they'll just somebody will put it on the discussion forum, and everybody will know the solution. So you want to generate. 100,000 different problems. How can you do that? So, so one way to do that is to basically the problem has a is a template, and you it has parameters, and you describe the you describe the you constrain the parameters, and then you use you use constraint sampling to generate random values for the parameters. And now you have a good chance that. Uh, there might be some collision, the same instances might be generated more than once, but in a, in a random way, so it's very unlikely that, that even people get the same problem, they will find each other. I, I, I'll find it very cool application. So, um, in around 2011, I started looking, okay, what's known about this? A student came to me to work, uh, asked to do research with me, I said, let's work on this problem, let's first do some homework. And it turned out that this is a classical problem. The theoreticians have looked at it going back to the mid-80s. And by the 2000, theoreticians said the problem is solved. And this was done by Bellare, Bellare Goldreich, and Petrang. And they showed that if you have a, a NP oracle, then you can generate witnesses in randomized polynomial time, polynomial time using this NP oracle. Such solver is an NP oracle. So I told my students, Kuldeep Mill, that first of all, let's implement the Bellari Goldrach Petrank uh, approach. So I implemented it, and we couldn't scale it above 16 variables, propositions. So the students want to write a paper, and I said, people are solving today problem with, with uh, at that point, with hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of propositions. If we do it with 16, they would just laugh at us, not publishable even. So we went back to the, to the drawing board. We had to improve the theory to get more scalable algorithms. We, lo we saw what else is available uh, in, the, in the more applied world. People use BDD, BDD methods, but it turned out that BDD scales better than what we did. It could scale to about a thousand variables, but not above it, so not good enough. We look what's happening in, we look what happened in AI. There, people use the mostly Monte Carlo Markov chain approaches. So you create a Markov chain that, that such that the, the stationary distribution is going to be uh, uniform, and then you take a random walk, which is long enough to get to the stationary distribution, and that's how you sample. The problem is to get really to stationary distribution, you need to take exponentially long random walk. So in practice, people chop chop the walk earlier, and they get good scalability, but poor uniformity. So we were able to take the theoretical work from, from earlier period, I mentioned uh, all the way to 2000, improve it, and get a good almost uniform generation of solution. 
And here are the key ideas, almost uniform. Again, it's a randomized polynomial algorithm with a SAT oracle. I'll explain what almost mean. It's based on universal hashing. I'll explain. It uh, uses SMT to solver. I'll explain. And we can scale it now to millions of variables. So, major from my point of view, the problem that I said to solve, yes, we solve it. We have to compromise on almost uniform, but to me, that's a reasonable compromise. So first, what is almost uniform? So suppose you have a formula phi, and the solution space is solo phi, and there are kappa solutions. So uniform means that every possible output has probability one over kappa. So they all they all have equal probability of being selected. Almost uniform allows for a slight deviation from that. So you have an error tolerance epsilon, maybe 0.1. And every output has probability, which is within almost 1 over kappa. But it is within 1 over kappa times 1 over 1 plus epsilon, and 1 over kappa divided by 1 plus epsilon. So it's within 10% of the, of the desired probability, or how, if you chose epsilon to be 0.1. So what is the basic idea? Basic idea is that uh, we're going to take this solution space, of, of which we know very little, a complex solution space. We'll divide it into roughly equal small cell of appropriate size. What's the appropriate size? We want to be able to enumerate the solution in each cell explicitly. So maybe a hundred solutions, a thousand solutions, not much more than that. And then we will uh, choose one of the cells at random. We'll enumerate the solution inside the cell and choose one at random. Now, because the cells are roughly equal, you will get a random solution almost uniformly. So this is the basic idea. Partition the, the space into roughly equal small cells, choose a cell, enumerate the solution, choose one at random, and you have, so, you have chosen a random, a random solution almost uniformly. The question is how we do this partitioning? How do we, how do we partition solo phi into roughly equal small cells. We know nothing about the distribution of solution. It's a crazy solution space. Here comes an idea from the early 80s, universal hashing by Carter and Wegman. All, in fact, going back even to 1979, middle ages practically. So what is universal hashing? So a hash function maps bit vector of length n to shorter bit vectors of length m, Here, typically m is much smaller than n. And a good hash function, and this is what people are used to study, good hash function, if the initial set of, of bit vectors is uh, roughly uniform, then the, the output will be roughly uniform. But suppose that the initial set is not uniform, it is very skewed, then it was hard to say it will get lots of collusion, so it will, the hash function may not do well. So the idea of universal of universal hash function is called, or technically it's the term universal family of hash function. You have, you have, a, universe, you have a family, you choose the hash, yeah, hash function randomly, and now it doesn't matter what is the initial distribution on the input, the output will be distributed uniformly, and that will give us that all cells will be, uh, will, the thing that, that collision, the cells are all valued mapped to the same, the same, to the same target, they will be roughly equal in expectation. So we are overcoming the arbitrariness of the input distribution by randomizing over it. So instead of assuming that the input distribution is random, the hash function chosen is random. We'll see examples. Now, it turns out that to do the analysis, you need a stronger property, and this is called strong universality. And what we want is that not just we want the uniformity, but we want independence. To do, that, to do the probabilistic analysis, we have to be able to multiply probabilities that require they are independent. So a, a family of R universal hash functions is a, such a mapping where every R, R element are mapped independently. You can say the whole set is independent, but every R element are mapped independently. And the, big, the higher the R, you have a strong guarantee on the distribution of the cells. 
So you want it to be, to get a better guarantee, you want R to be as high as possible. And for that, you have to deal with polynomial of high degree, and that's expensive. So if you raise, if you raise the, the R of the degree of independence, then it's more expensive. And so it turned out that was the problem with, remember that we have implemented Belari Goldrach Petrank BGP, and uh, we said, well, uh, it didn't scale well because they went for any universality. And that gave them beautiful result. All cells are small, and they got uniform generation. But it was very expensive. It didn't scale. We had a new analysis to show that you can get away with three universality. But now we don't get all the cells are small. A random cell is small with high probability. And that's why we get almost uniform generation. But this enables us to go from tens of variables to millions of variables. So <clears throat> how do we do this such a hashing? So remember, we're dealing here with, with Boolean, Boolean variable, and assignment is a bit vector. If there are n variable, they are, uh, we are talking about n-bit vectors. And we want to divide the whole space into 2 to the m cell, where m is not much, much smaller than n. So we have n variable. So we add new constraints. I call XOR clauses, XOR constraints. But we are going to generate XOR clauses at random. So every variable with probability half, we put it in the clause, with probability half, we don't put it in the clause. So we, we get some random clause, x1 plus x7 plus plus plus, plus x1 at 17, and then the value would be randomly, which was 0 or 1. So such a bit vector splits the solution space in half. Now we choose another XOR clause. It's split it again in half. If you have m XOR clauses, you have to do the m cells. And so now we, we have to we choose one cell at random, and we choose a solution at random, and we have a a random solution, almost random solution. Now, how do we solve a cell? A cell is going to be a conjunction of CNF and XOR clauses. We have solver that can solve CNF, but how do we combine CNF and XOR clauses? So here we use a development that started around the year 2000, which is SMT, that is Fability Model of Theory. And now you take propositional, just CNF solving, but you add other type of constraints, for example, linear constraints, or bit vector, bit vector constraints, XOR constraints. So in 2000, this area has, prog has progressed tremendously in, in 2000 because in many applications, you do want to reason about, you want to co combine logic with, what, with the theory. For example, you want to reason about linear constraints. It's very important, or about bit, bit vectors. So in 2009, Matesus developed a software called Crypto Minisat, which was about com dealing with combination of CNF and XORs. And the idea is that XOR by themselves we can solve very easily because they're simply linear equations modulo 2. So we can do Gaussian elimination, elimination modulo 2 and solve them. But the challenge is to combine such solving with Gaussian elimination. And he showed how to do it. And he built a solver. His goal was to break cryptographic protocol. That was not a success. But the solver was, was ready for us, so that this was a beautiful example. You build something for one purpose, it was not a success, but you can be very successful for, for a constraint sampling. How good is it? So here we did a comparison. We, we took a problem uh, with, a, with a, about, um, I think, a million solutions, and then we built a uniform sampler because there are, we, we, know, we enumerate all the solutions, so we, we sample uniformly, and uniformly is the red line. And then we, the, uh, the, green, the green plot here is the unigen, is our almost uniform solver, a uh, sampler. And here you say, for example, for each, sol each solution, I'm sorry, not million solutions, 16,000 solutions, each solution, how many times it has been, has been picked? Every solution can be picked multiple times because we sample a million times. I'm sorry, we sample a million times from 60,000 solutions. And you can see that statistically these are indistinguishable. So we got very, very good. The almost uniform sampler is, is 
indistinguishable in parties from a uniform sampler and of course incredibly faster. In fact, how much faster? Well, we compare it at the time to, to a, a tool was called ExoSample Prime, which was a tool that, make, that made no uniformity guarantee. It was best effort guarantee. And you can see that we are able to both offer guaranteed, almost uniformity guaranteed on one hand, and still you see here a speed up of several orders of magnitude by using better solving technology. So this was so success that we decided if we can, even though the real motivation was uh, testing, we said, can we use this technology to do other things? And we went to a problem called counting. And counting is we have a solution, we have again a Boolean formula, now we want to know how many new solutions are there. So if you have a P or Q, you have four solutions, right? Zero, one, one, zero, and one, one. So you want to count. Sharp SAT is complete for sharp P. Sharp P is the class of counting problem for the simple mean NP introduced by Valley in 1979, and sharp SAT is complete for sharp P. So again, this is a problem with many, many applications. Again, random constraint testing is one because you want to know how many, you have to have an idea what is the size of the solution space, but many other applications in AI, in particular in AI as well. But it turned out that, that we are very good at doing SAT solving. We can solve problems with millions of variables. Sharp SAT is much, much harder. Counting solution is much, much harder. Now we're talking about problem with tens of thousands of variables. Okay, no, nothing, nothing, not like millions of variables. So uh, really a difference of, a, of a two orders of magnitude. So much harder problem. So again, instead of doing uniform count, a, a, a exact counting, we're going to do approximate counting. And the idea is what I would call trustworthy approximation. And you might have heard of this term, probably approximately correct. So what is it? So here you allow yourself, first of all, an error tolerance. You have a formula fee. Let's say it has couple solutions. You allow yourself an er error tolerance epsilon, but also an confidence requirement delta. And you want the count to be, you can use a randomized algorithm, and you want the count to be between kappa times one plus epsilon and kappa divided by time plus epsilon, and this should happen with probability at least, with at least delta. So you want with high confidence, small, small error. That's what you want to accomplish. This concept was introduced by Stockmar in 1983, Pack. Later on, Valen talk about about uh, about again about Pack, and what all we know about it is that uh, the time people looked at it, it's in BPP, which is randomized polynomial time, with an NP oracle. This algorithm that that Stockmar and then and then Jerome Sinclair and Valiant, this is as far as I can see, it never been implemented. But if you look, it's very clear that it, the implementation will not scale. We saw it already with with uh, uh, with sampling that the theoretical result do not yield scalable algorithm. The same thing is true here. So again, the idea was to go back to see if we can take that our, our approach to approximate sampling and go from them to approximate counting. So again, we will use these extra clauses to generate a small cell, but now instead of sampling from a cell, we will count the number of solutions in the cell, we'll multiply it by two to the m, Remember, with two to the m cell, we'll multiply by two to the m. We'll get an estimate of the of the of the count, and we'll we'll do it many times. We'll get many estimates. We'll take the median, and then as you do it more time, it increases your confidence, and you can show that it you can by doing enough times, you can get to the right level of confidence. And the algorithm is polynomial in phi, in the size of phi, in one over epsilon, in one over log of one minus delta. And of course, but it's, of course, it's not a PITAM algorithm. It, co it uses a SAT oracle. It uses a SAT solver as an oracle here. So we get a bound on how many times are we, are we going to call a SAT solver. The answer is we're going to call the SAT solver polynomial many times. The polynomial will depend also on epsilon and delta. And epsilon and, uh, yeah, and delta. Okay, so we build the tool, approximate C. 
And then we gave it a, a fairly liberal epsilon, 0.75. So we allow us 75% uh, error. And we compare it to a exact counter. Cache is an exact counter. And we found out to our big surprise that, that it was within 5% of the correct answer. So even though we allow ourselves 75% error, we got 5% error, and that means that probably what it means is our analysis is not tight enough, and it's waiting for someone to come and do a much tighter analysis. What about scalability? Well, for, for small formulas, Cache scales better. But Cache come to a certain size of formulas, maybe around 50,000, and it just runs out of steam. Essentially, we know that if Cache is running more than five minutes, it will never finish. So the right approach is for to run both both uh, solvers in parallel. If Cache solves it, good, you stop. But if it, if it doesn't, there is a better chance that approximate C will scale to much bigger problems. Um, now, so this is how we talked about, I told you about, this is my attempt, my, my effort at making logic quantitative by looking at sampling and counting. And this immediately found a, an approach my student, Kuldeep Mill, went on after he finished his PhD. This, I'm not involved in this work, but I think it's a very nice result. This is how you can use approximate counting to the analysis, to the quantitative analysis of neural networks. So the problem that they were looking is you have a set of N uh, neural network and a probability P of interest. And they want to estimate the probability that P is satisfied. And the, prop the, prop the property was have to do with security application, robustness, uh, Trojan attacks, fairness, and the like. And the key technology they used in this nice paper was approximacy. So logic, we can apply logic, we can combine, we can use logic to reason about neural nets. I want to conclude the talk with a bit of philosophizing here. So, kind of the main me message of, of my talk is, on one hand, we talked about machine learning and logic, but the technical development to make logic quantitative is, is built on, on, on a revolutionary progress in such solver of the past 25 years. I think, I think the mistake was to call it CDCL. Who knows what the hell is CDCL? I think deep solving would be in the right term. Just like deep learning, we should talk about deep solving. And what, what I hope to have convinced you that such solving, such solver today are an enabler. You can do many things if you have a such solver. I just gave you an example of approximate sampling and counting. And there's a rule in, in, uh, in mathematics. If you have a hammer, big hammer, look for nails. So such solver are now big hammers. Can we, we should all, you should all look for nails to see how you, to use them. And it's important to say we have not solved the problem. It's an epic complete problem. So scalability is an ongoing challenge, and much ongoing work is focusing on taking this technology of sampling and counting and scale it better and better. But let's finish by talking about P versus NP. There is an old, old cliche, what is the difference between theory and practice? In theory, they're not that different, but in practice, they're quite different. So let's look at the P versus NP, which is considered by many to be the, the, the main open problem in theoretical computer science. But then in, it's not a problem that necessarily has practical, practical significance. Why? It could be that P equal NP, but the polynomial is N to the thousand. So practically, it's just you cannot use it. In fact, even N to the hundred is not practical. Even N to the 20 is not practical. On the other hand, it could be that P is different than NP, but you can solve all NP problems in n to the log, log, log n times operations. Well, think of think of what happened. In fact, even uh, think of what, what you know. Take n to be the number of 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 Planck uh, time units since the beginning of the universe. Log log n log 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 n is going to be a small number. So n to the log 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 n is a very practical algorithm, even though it's not polynomial. So we can solve P versus NP positively or negatively and may have no practical benefits. On the other hand, I think the development we start solving really raises questions on this fundamental, on what is complex theory about. 
So when I was a graduate student, that was a scary problem. You do not touch it with a 10 foot pole. And indeed, we know that that is a hard problem. We can, synth we can s create synthetic problems with a few hundred variables that not SAT solver can solve. But for somehow real life SAT sol uh, problems can be solved, you know, we're solving huge industrial problems. And complex theory doesn't tell us why. And this question, I mean, the goal of complex theory is to explain easiness and hardness. And we used to say, okay, this is p-time versus np-complete. That's not the case anymore. So one is a beautiful theoretical question here. What explains the easiness and hardness of some SAT instances? But from the practical side, now that SAT is easy in practice, I write easy in quotes, easy in practice, how can we leverage it? Leverage that? And maybe we should take BPP to the NP, which is randomized polynomial time with, with a SAT solver oracle as our new P time. And going back to where I started, from model driven to data driven computer science as back, what we're seeing here is a paradigm glide, not paradigm shift in my opinion. Data driven computer science refined model driven computer science, just as the physicists still teach mechanics electromagnetism and optics, classical physics, we should still teach formal model-driven computer science to our students. But we should, if we really want human-centered AI, we need to bridge the gap between machine learning and logic. And I'll stop here, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, me from from right now uh let's let me let me figure out to stop sharing okay stop sharing okay here it is can you hear okay. me yes now. i can hear you i can hear you okay um uh, for those of uh, listeners who are uh, listening uh through the web uh, webex uh, you can raise your hand and uh, me or чем ты чем ты можешь давать упражнения домовыми? We will let you uh, ask the question. For those of you who are here, you can ask just in in the camera. So uh, the. Um, I hope that uh, participants. Uh, oh, how I can? You cannot. You cannot. Okay, let me. Uh, should I, how I can? Ah, full screen. Okay. And right now I can see there is a okay. And right now the the uh, participant two seven three 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 six eight. You can turn on your mic. Oh yes. Say something. Hello. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. I'm sorry. Is it uh, is it me to say something? Yes. Is it you? Yes. It so, you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, um, uh, my name is Jacek Koronaski. Well, it's not very important, of course. Uh, I, thought that you, I thought your name was two seven three 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 six eight zero one. That's right. So, so that's it. That's it. Let let it stay <laughs> as uh, two seven three three etc. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I am uh, say Professor Emeritus from the. Polish Academy of Sciences, and and my question is uh, very simple. Namely, I haven't got it. Uh, um, uh, do you really control this epsilon and delta, or yeah, just is it is it, is it yes? Uh, truly this is user control. user user choice user choice. This I understand, but yeah. uh, user choice and uh, mm, and not approximately, not so to say uh, asymptotically, but truly controlled. I'm not sure I, I understand what you mean by truly controlled. You uh, let's let's suppose uh, I run it and I say, okay, I want accuracy of uh, of five percent. That's right, and I get and it. I choose epsilon. And I really get point. it. 
I really to, get it. Yeah, Without yeah. Uh, any, so to say, additional approximation uh, for what I yeah. have is an asymptotic theorem, so to say. Okay, no, 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 no there's, there's no asymptotics it. here. Yeah. Thank you. Just great. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, Thomas, you can speak now. Uh, just turn on mic. Do you hear me? Yes. 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 I am Thomas from AG in in Krakow. Thank you for a very uh, inspiring uh, presentation. However, my question is: uh, What about model checking? And uh, do you think that this, let's say, approach will will be? Uh, not used in the future because we have also probabilistic model checking all these uh, achievements by Marta Kwiatkowska from Oxford University and there is also uh, also uh, approach which is promising according to let's say formal uh, verification of software etc so what what Marka has done a, a great work, she's really a world leader in probabilistic model checking in the following sense. You are given a probabilistic system. You're breathing a, a system that behaves stochastically and you want to say, okay, I want to know that with a, a probability uh, 0.9, it will reach, it will reach a, a particular a state, for example, okay? Yeah. Uh, we build the point nine. To, it will avoid a particular state. And now you run an exact algorithm to do that. And the reason is the result uh, the, you get probabilistic guarantees because the system is probabilistic. Okay. Yeah. Here, here it's different. We're starting from a description which is there is no probability in the description. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are. We want to get an answer that will have some probabilistic quality. So it's different. It's not a, it's not exact. One is exact reasoning about probabilistic systems. And what what I describe here it's dual to that. It's probabilistic reasoning about exact systems. Okay, and uh, there is also uh, there are also uh, weighted SAT solvers. So it's so, uh, yeah. This is this is of the same thing here. So here I I didn't talk about weights. Okay. Yeah. Here I did not talk about weights, but another another uh, approach here is uh, to assign to find some way to assign weights to satisfying assignment. The most one of the popular approaches that every every literal has a weight. So you take proposition P, then P being true has some weight, and not P not P being or P being false has another weight. They could be uh, some some up to one or not. Don't necessarily have to. And then we can ask, for example, uh, and then you take the weight of the whole assignment to be the product of all the literal weights. And then there is weighted model counting, for example, that uh, that can handle, that can ask for the sum of all the weights of the satisfying assignments. So here, essentially, I gave every assignment uh, the same weight. They're all all assignments have weight one. So I just took the count. Yeah, but this yeah. is a special this is a special case of the weighted case where mm -hmm. every assignment has a weight and you want mm -hmm. to there, there are different questions you may want to ask you may want to ask for the total the total weight of the satisfying assignment you may want to use to ask for the maximal weight what is the the heaviest satisfying assignment maximum satisfying assignment of maximum of maximum maximal weight so there are, there are kind of extensions using the the approach I described today is it's an area of research, and part of the issue is that now you have to deal with the numbers. Mm -hmm. And so one approach is to try to encode, the, the, you, to write the numbers in binary, and encode the bits as propositions. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely, these are all important research direction. And that's what I said, this is ongoing research. This is by no means uh, that we've solved all the problem. We've yeah. just, we've just started, we've only started. Okay, uh, because we have some experience with uh, using these uh, weighted uh, weights, uh, weighted uh, solvers uh, in some real um, 
checking the application. So, yeah, this, no, no. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, very, imp very important. I mean, I had a student who just finish a, his PhD thesis on on weighted what's called weighted counting. Okay, thank you very much. Very important. If you Thanks. if you send me if you send me email, I'll send you a pointer to his dissertation. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? You? Yeah. Everybody seems to is singing. And just okay. So, uh, Moshe, one small question, but it's rather organ uh, organization question. Is it possible that you share with us uh, the presentation? Absolutely. And yeah, uh, you allow us to um, uh, make uh, this uh, recording of your lecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Public. yeah. Is, is yeah. it a yeah. fact? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, because I, I received several uh, requests uh, to uh, to have this recorded, like to uh, later, because people cannot participate but would like uh, to participate. So, uh, no more questions. I have a question. Uh, like uh, I can imagine that um, machine learning is used to solve problems for in, in logic. I can imagine that logic is used to solve problem in machine learning, but I imagine that you are talking about something uh, in between, blended between these two disciplines. So my question actually is uh, where it is being developed. Uh, what community, which university is working on this? So I think if you look at the approach in general. Again, it's a very broad approach, and people mean different things by it, okay? Is neurosymbolic reasoning. And to say, basically, we have two modes of reasoning. One is symbolic, and one is neural, based on neural nets, and how do we combine, combine them? So, again, there are, uh, I mean, there are even people who propose, uh, um, for example, graph neural nets to solve problem in logic. So people propose graph neural net to solve satisfiability problem. Um, it's a, it's a, I mean, I, I'm not an expert, but I, but again, I'm happy to send you some. Uh, there are some survey that I, I wrote with some people, and uh, if you send me email later, I'll happy to send you a survey to neurosymbolic reasoning. Okay, I, I have one more. This is kind of, you know, uh, maybe basic, maybe not, let's see. You started uh, this talk by saying that uh, uh, you are not a fan of uh, all these hype related to GPT-3. Could you sh share with us some of these, um, let's say, uh, feelings? <laughs> ah, okay. So, what people say is that, uh, I mean, there's a lot of noise now about GPT, but the, the, most, the most recent one, chat GPT in particular, so the description is that chat, chat GPT is a very uh, polished bullshitter. So somebody uh, asked it to generate mission statement for university. And it's beautiful. It's complete bullshit, but it's beautiful bullshit, I have to say. It's a very impressive, it's a, it says there's nothing original. You can go and you look at, you just, you you... You know, if I gave it to a, a, a freshman student, I said, okay, write a mission statement of university. What are they going to do? They're going to Google and find many mission statements that are going to take a sentence from, a sentence from there and put it together. And if they're good, they'll polish it and it will come coherent, but it will not say anything meaningful. So I write a bi-monthly column for CSCM. And I saw some people says, wow, you know, people said now, I, you know, I don't need to write papers anymore. ChatGPT will write papers. So as a test, I, I gave, I asked GPT, I gave him the subject of different columns and I see what will, will he write? And in each case he wrote, he wrote complete bullshit. Very polished. I mean, it's not, it's not trivial. I mean, we should underestimate it, okay? Very polished uh, bullshit, but bullshit nevertheless. No original idea. I really did not see in any case that anything that I say, wow, this is, it was all, my goodness, beautiful bullshit. 
And so I kind of said, oh, okay, I still, I'm, I'm not out of a job. I can still continue to write. And hopefully when I write, I want to say original things, right? That's what I want to say, original thing, original thought. Thought that people will find interesting. So I have, people are impressed by the Polishness, by how Polish are these pieces are from, and I said the degree of Polishness is really, that was a big step forward. If you look at previews, even from like GPT-3 and this other thing, that the text, that they didn't produce things that are as polished as chat GPT. But if we think that this is a, and I, you know, I mean, it would be interesting to look at the, at the, this concept of Polish, 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 not Polish, it's Polish actually it's called, the noun is Polish. Um, if you look at how Polish a piece, piece is, is maybe it is some sign of intelligence. But if you look for original ideas, I think they will require a very different type of breakthrough. People are saying, oh, well, just give it more data. I don't see that. I think the better data and the better architecture, all of this leads to better Polish. But I, I'm, I think there will be a whole other. I'm, I, I'm agnostic whether how soon this is going to be. People are saying, well, you know, within five years it's going to happen. I have no idea. I may be skeptical, but I have no idea. But I think we need new ideas that will enable AI to generate ideas. We are impressed by people who are thinker because people can generate ideas. Uh, and I have, not, I have not yet GPT. I have not sent this all these uh, what's called LLMs, large language models. I have not seen them at all doing anything that seem to be generating ideas. Um, if I may, some comments to what uh, did you say? Um, Please. A couple, of, a couple of days ago, I uh, participated in the conference where you have uh, you you was a keynote speaker, and next day it was Yo Yo Wu from University of. London College or something like this, who presented um, that GPT-3 can discover, based on a language model, the uh, psychological um, silhouette or, or profile of people and suggest a different description of this profile to people. So, I, uh, we can be skeptical toward GPT-3, but definitely a lot of people uh, just trust it. So it's like... The, 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 there's no question that what we have seen in the last uh, roughly 10 years in, in machine learning has been revolutionary progress. I, I, I completely agree. Uh, in the area of, of uh, image recognition, image transfer, image generation, um, and the, lang lang the large language model, I mean, the fact that we can now create text that I would say, even though it's bullshit, it seems so polished that if I show it to someone just a couple of years ago, they would say, no, 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 there's no way this was written by, by AI. And now it has. So I think this is clearly, uh, and we've reached a milestone of progress with, the, the, with ChatGPT. But if, if people are looking at the Holy Grail, which is AGI, artificial general intelligence, and are saying, well, we just have to continue on the same path, that's what I'm kind of skeptical, that just by making more parameters and, and more data that we are already digesting practically everything you can, you can find on the Internet. Okay? So um, I think new ideas will be required to reach AGI, if we can. And I think that, uh, again, the, again, the human brain combines neural reasoning with logical reasoning. This is the fast and slow thinking. Of course, everything is based on neural, okay? But, uh, you know, the fact that uh, I can generate new ideas, and they are new to me, right? I can think of something, oh, my goodness, I thought of something new, new to me. I, have, I surprise myself sometimes because I think of something new, a new idea. And the new idea could be... Um, even when you solve a problem and you, you are working it hard and suddenly you have a new idea how to solve the problem. So that we don't really still understand. And so I think that uh, it's a very exciting area of research. But I just don't like the religious approaches that say, oh, we have this technology deep learning, so that's going to do everything. I'm, I'm just a bit more pragmatic. We should take everything we have in our arsenal and use it to make progress.
Okay. But I'm interested in, in this psychological profiling. Would you send me a link? Uh, yes, I will try. It's uh, I will try as much as uh, I, I can because it's uh, the the recording probably will be possible uh, will be available like open access. I will find out and will send you. Okay. And okay. Uh, you also can send me this article uh, what you promised uh, the the uh, Shemek, uh, about neurosymbolic. Uh, yes, I will. I will. I will send you the survey. Yeah. Yes, so I will share with him and I will share with my PhD student who is uh, um, like, he likes it. <laughs> He's very interested in it. Okay. Very good. Uh, one more question from. Uh, I think that it's from. Uh, from uh, from uh, Jacek Kolonaski again. Uh, uh, just just one uh, uh, comment. Uh, <laughs> Uh, kind of a funny comment, namely uh, when we when we get to this uh, psychological profiling. Uh, let me recall all of you, I think, of uh, of a company, software company, a wonderful co software company, <laughs> uh, namely Cambridge Analytica. They did a very good uh, psychological profiling for uh, then uh, candidate Donald Trump. And uh, perhaps you uh, you don't remember this or even do not know that, uh, but that was really interesting. And that was based on a very interesting uh, uh, test uh, by a psychologist and uh, from from uh, from Oxbridge. I do not remember neither. I I, I remember ne neither of his name nor. Uh, whether it was it is uh, Cambridge or, or Oxford. Uh, anyway, anyway, with this uh, silly AI, we can do a lot of things. Uh, but this is still this silly AI, which is based on on data, on uh, on 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 manipulating with them wisely, of course. But of course, no new ideas, just data and good analysis of those and that's it and that's uh, that uh, that company cambridge analytica by analytica by the way they were nobody of them was imprisoned but but they by they had to close uh, uh, the company uh, for they used uh, somewhat illegally uh, say data from facebook yeah. or whatever that was but an interesting story by the way okay thank you, you. i'm no. sorry uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't have to go. You don't have to go to the illegal use. What do you think Facebook is but, doing? But they did. They did. They I know. Did I know. To, to I know. Yeah, that's but, why. Of course, you do not have to. Of no, no. But the right. point is, what does Facebook do? This is this is exactly what Facebook does. The goal right. of Facebook is to show you advertisements. That's true. Of course. So they have to, of course and they match the advertisements to you personally by creating that's a psychological right. profile. This is all but the it, same thing, yes, yes. Google does the same thing. This is this is not, nothing revolutionary here. Nothing, Basically, nothing. Go Google does exactly the same thing. Google does exactly, Google and Facebook. And, and they know everything and, in a sense about us. Everything in a sense, of course. They, but, but yeah, yeah, we agree totally. Uh, of course, yeah, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Comments? Questions? Sorry? Uh, uh, the question from. Uh, uh, <laughs> you can ask Moshe what he is doing on Facebook all the time. Uh, yeah, exactly, Moshe. Uh, what What is your relation with Facebook? Because I think that you are quite uh, open on Facebook, and uh, I think he's there all the time. I mean, it's like almost no day without Moshe on Facebook. <laughs> I have a I have a love hate relationship with Facebook. <laughs> you ask about my relationship. I tell you my relationship with Facebook. <laughs> okay. I like I like I like connecting with people. I like it very much. I like sharing with people very much. I, I hate the business model. And I hate, I hate being manipulated. And I, you know the worry is you know people talk a lot about the privacy issue which is how they gather all this information about us. I worry more about the fact, the influencing aspect, okay? They, sh they determine what we see 
and how much are they, how much are we influenced by them? And that's very, you know, it's very hard to estimate because it is one, you know, it's one thing at a time. So we don't know what is the collective impact of how you're being influenced. The Cambridge, I mean, one of the big things about the Cambridge Analytica is they use this pop, they've reached into, they were able to use this, uh, uh, the collected data not only on people, but on the friends and the friends. And then they were able to show them kind of the, the advertisements and content. And there is a big, you know, if you look at the end at the, at the 20, uh, 18, uh, no, 2016 election, it was determined at the end by something like 67 votes, 67, 70, no, 70,000 votes in three states. Because it goes by, you know, the American system is, you go by electors, so it's important to win a state, you get the electors. And three states, you know, 70,000 people voting more for Trump than for Clinton, that were enough to sway the election. And the big spec—I mean, we never know—but how much Cambridge Analytica was successful in in influencing the vote of uh, seventy thousand people. So I'm worried about the influence that this company have on us. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, again, it was wonderful, and pity that you are not here. But uh, honestly, I am a little bit jealous because I see the sun. <laughs> In your place, in our place, it's snow and very grayish weather. So I don't know. Maybe I prefer to be there than you here. Oh. Let me tell you what the temp the temperature here is about. Uh... Don't tell me, please. Don't tell me. I will be. <laughs> I will cry. <laughs> okay. Let's 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 put it this way. I'm wearing. I, you don't see that, but I'm wearing shorts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, thank you, and um, uh, I will share this recording and uh, your presentation. Uh, 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 just send me and yeah, uh, I will send you the presentation and and the pointer to the paper. Yep. Okay, great. Again, thank you, thank you for hosting thank me, you. and uh, next time in next time in Warsaw, in in, in, in Warsaw. Yep. <laughs> okay, bye bye, and have a good day. Bye bye.